general overview of metabolism because you will need to use that to answer your questions on here and metabolism is one of those things that you have to hear it and look at it multiple times for it to make sense. So we're not going over all of the little details in the reactions, we're going over the summaries and key points of the reactions and you will still find that that is plenty to go through. One of the reasons I really like people to have a good understanding of this though is there is so many misleading things out there, so many fad diets out there that give you pseudoscience on metabolism that if you have a good idea of how it works, you can look at it and critique for yourself because humans didn't come with a manual of what exactly do we need to eat, what is the optimal amount of it, and so people get little bits and pieces of research and a lot of it's been extrapolated. The research is certainly not always objective. Research has to be paid for by somebody. The researchers don't work for free. And a lot of times it is paid for by people who definitely have a financial interest in making sure that humans keep consuming something because that's what their industry is. So it's really helpful if you have an idea of how this works so you can look and go you know what that is not making sense they seem to be making some jumps in logic here that don't seem to be true that you can evaluate the information for yourself so when we look at the metabolic pathways we are going to follow the pathway of glucose yes we consume things other than glucose but pretty much everything else is going to join into this main pathway so that's the one that we start with. So when we look at glucose, and there we go. glucose is a sugar with six carbons. And the reason I am mentioning the amount of carbons is your metabolic pathways in di digesting carbohydrates are concerned at breaking down the carbons off of your carbohydrates. So you start out with glucose, which is a six carbon sugar, and at the end of completely breaking it down, it all gets turned into carbon dioxide. So you will get six carbon dioxide out of this at the end. So if you can look and say, I can see what's happened to all of the carbons along the way, that's a useful way of getting an idea. Am I reading these reactions and pathways correct? So your glucose starts out and it goes through a series of 10 steps. These reactions are reversible. And in that series of 10 steps, we're going to split this in half and break it down into two pyruvates. Each of those pyruvates has three carbons. So at this point, all of our carbons are still accounted for. So if you remember from the muscle section of the notes, we talked about this molecule ATP, adenosine triphosphate, as our energy currency. That's what we're looking to gain out of breaking these things down. Your purpose of metabolism is to take the energy from the food you consume, be able to get the energy out of it, and use it to fuel other reactions. And what you're gonna use is your intermediary step is ATP. It's like you go to work, you get paid in dollars, you use those dollars to pay all your other bills. So think of ATP like that. In order to get this started, we have to invest a little bit of ATP into this reaction, but you are going to get more out of it. What you're gonna end up with is a net gain of two ATP at the end of it. So you get a little bit of energy back out of this. We also move some electrons around in here in the process. You're also going to get two NADHs. NAD plus is a molecule that will help move electrons. So when it gets the electrons put on it, it will become NADH. The electrons take their protons with it hence having the hydrogens on there. So when you see this, it just means you've had to move some electrons in the process. So this basic process here, where you start out splitting things, is called glycolysis.
lysolysis is going to go down that direction. It literally means to lyse glucose. When you lyse something, you split it. So the name gives you a big hint. If we send it up the other direction and reverse the reactions, what you're going to do is make more glucose. We call that gluconeogenesis. which literally means generate new glucose. So again, use the words to actually give you the hints of what's going on. So why would you want to do that? Your brain and your nervous system run on glucose. So if for some reason you've taken in something else, this is what your brain wants to run on. And it will break down other things if it needs to, to keep your brain functioning. So during this process, we haven't had to incorporate any oxygen into it. So we can say that this process here is anaerobic. No oxygen's been added yet. So once we get to pyruvate, you have a couple of choices. If oxygen is present, you're gonna be able to continue on with cellular respiration and do it in an aerobic fashion. If it's not, you have to do fermentation. Having oxygen present is going to be the more efficient reactions. So if that option is available, that's what it's going to take. So we're going to look at the aerobic choice first here. We're going to take that pyruvate that has two carbons. This part of the reaction is irreversible here. So I'm just going to emphasize this with this solid arrow. Those two pyruvates, and you're going to have two of these down are going to be converted into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA only has two carbons. So we have to account for those carbons here. They don't just disappear into nowhere. So we know energy is not created or destroyed. Same thing with matter. They're all accounted for. They're going to be pulled off as carbon dioxide. So what do you think is going to happen to that carbon dioxide? <laughs> so in here, when you were blowing in the pink liquid, that's the carbon dioxide that you were exhaling. And it dissolved into this liquid. So the more activity you do, the more of this you're going to do. You start to breathe harder because your body wants to eliminate that carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide being in your bloodstream is going to cause these small fluctuations in your pH. So when we pull off that carbon dioxide, we are also going to move some electrons here. So you're going to have some more NADH. So remember, all of this here, you have two of these because you had two pyruvates. So you'll get two carbon dioxides, two NADHs, two acetylcholates from this point. For a total of six. You you have two of it's. You're going to have a total of six come off, but you're going to pay them off later. Okay. We're not completely done with it yet. Okay. So now we have these acetyl coas that we have to break down, and they're going to go into a cycle here, where this is a two carbon molecule. You have a four carbon molecule left over from the last turn of this cycle, that you will add the two carbons there. You're going to make a six carbon molecule here. So it gets added in. As you are breaking this down, there is going to be a couple places where you're going to pull off more carbon dioxide. So when you have two turns of this cycle, because you have two acetyl-CoA's, Here's two carbon dioxides. Each turn through is going to pull off two carbon dioxides. So we have two turns through, two, four, six carbon dioxides that will be pulled off completely. So that's going to account for all of your carbons. When those are pulled off, you're also going to pull off other things that are going to come out of this cycle. You're going to pull off NADH. You're also going to pull off FADH2. 
So these are going to be other ways that you're going to remove electrons. But in moving the electrons here, it's a way of kind of storing the energy that you're going to exchange it later. And then you're going to have GTP that's going to get converted into ATP. So ATP is that main energy currency that we like. If you think of it being like dollars, you got some euros, you got some Canadian dollars, you got some pesos. They're just other ways of holding that energy for you that you'll convert later on. So you pulled off two carbons here, you've taken two off of the six, that's going to allow you to regenerate back to the four carbon molecule that you started with. So this one we call the Krebs cycle, or the citric acid cycle. It's sometimes also called the TCA cycle or tricarboxylic acid cycle. We like to have plenty of names for the same thing in here. So these are the two that you'll probably see the most. Um, all of the textbooks I use here use one of these two names. So we'll see either of those. So that's going to be how we get all of those carbon dioxides off. So now we come back to it and we look and we go, well, this is the energy currency that the body likes to use. So what happens if you go to the grocery store, and we're not going to the grocery store in Canada, you're going to a grocery store in Washington, and you bring with you some pesos, some euros, some Canadian dollars. What are they going to say when you walk up to that? They're going to send you a way to exchange it. So the body is going to need to exchange these and convert it into a form of energy that it can use. So we are going to take these here, and these are going to go into the electron transport chain. Which is in your mitochondria. They remember that's the organelle that's the powerhouse of the cell. I think it kind of looks like a sausage, a nice plump sausage with this internal membrane inside of it. So in the membrane, you have these carrier proteins inside of there. What's going to happen is the NADH is going to come in. It's going to drop its electrons off at the carrier protein. And when the electrons pass through there, carrier protein is going to pump a hydrogen ion onto the other side of the membrane. FADH2 cuts in line a little bit, but it will drop it off and what's going to happen is NADH is going to pump three hydrogens across the membrane. FADH2 is going to pump two across the membrane. You have a separation of protons and electrons. So what happens when you have positive and negative separated? What do they want to do? They want to come back together. So at the end, you have this enzyme, ATP synthase, that is going to allow that to happen. So these are all going to come back through here. And in letting those hydrogens come back through, the ATP synthase is going to say, that's great, you can come back in. But what I'm going to have you do is take an ADP. And when you come back in, I want you to glue the third phosphate on there. So you can turn it into ATP. So what you get is an exchange rate for every NADH, you're going to get three ATP. For every FADH2, you're going to get two ATP. So when you look at all of the NADHs that you've acquired throughout the process and run it through your exchange rate, all of your FADH2s 
Then you're going to have your GTP that's going to get converted through a different mechanism to make one ATP. You're going to end up with 34 ATP from your electron transport chain in Krebs conversions plus 2 ATP from glycolysis so you're going to have a net gain total of 36 ATP So what is useful to do is if you look and you take it from the top here and you're like, okay, I can see I have two glucoses, so it gives me two NADHs. I'm going to get two NADHs here. You're going to count all of them that you're going to get off here, all of the FADH2s. And there are in your notes more detailed cycles of these that you can look at to see where exactly each of the things come off. Your key things you want to remember, though, is what is coming off. I'm not going to ask you to memorize the intermediates. You can look and you can account for all of these and see, all right, this is how many we get. And you can follow where your ATP comes from. So what you will want to be able to know is your summaries. What, does, what happens in glycolysis? Glucose broken down into two pyruvates, net gain of two ATP, two NADHs off of it. Pyruvate gets converted to acetyl-CoA, you lose NADH, carbon dioxide off of it. Krebs cycle, gonna give you carbon dioxide, NADH, FADH2, and a GTP that converts to ATP. Electron transport chain does this exchange here for you. So try and keep it simple, big picture like that. And if you understand that, you can always go back and look at the little details in there. When you're looking at a lot of the sheets that have more of the details on there, they will also list an enzyme in between. So every step has an enzyme that's going to control the reactions. A lot of those enzymes are gonna have cofactors or coenzymes, and that's where your vitamins and minerals come in. So if you're not getting adequate vitamins and minerals, your enzymes aren't all going to work properly for all of these steps to happen. The B vitamins in particular make up a lot of the coenzymes in here. So sometimes people will say, you know, I just feel like I have so much more energy when I take B vitamins. It's not the B vitamins themselves that are giving you the energy. You're still getting the energy from the glucose carbohydrate, but what the B vitamin is doing is allowing all of your enzymes to work properly. Human nature tends to be, well, a few of those were good, I'm gonna take more. That doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna keep getting more energy, once you have all of your enzymes working, there's really no point to take more vitamin in there. You've already activated all of the enzymes. It's wasted. It's not going to activate enzymes that aren't there. So this is well you're going to have your carbohydrates go. If you have other carbohydrates, it's usually only a couple steps to get them into glucose here. So of course we're going to eat things other than just carbohydrate then we will look at that but what are we going to do if you continue to have anaerobic conditions we cannot store pyruvate so instead what we will do is we are going to convert that pyruvate into lactic acid this is sometimes called your lactic acid cycle or the Cori cycle. So this is something you can store for a while in your body. You can also convert it back into pyruvate and break it down. But what it does do is it is going to provide NAD plus into your cycle here so that you can keep doing glycolysis. So when you're doing things anaerobically, you're not actually getting energy from this here making lactic acid. 
what it does is it allows you to keep doing glycolysis to produce energy. So if you don't have oxygen available, this is a stopping point for you here. You can't progress on to this phase. You have to have oxygen available. If oxygen's available, when you look here, 36 ATP. That's pretty efficient. If you look at an activity where you have plenty of oxygen available, you're able to keep breathing. You can keep walking. You can walk for hours because you're going at a low enough intensity, you can keep regenerating that oxygen. Say you decide to go to a track and you're doing a dead-on sprint, as fast as you can. How long is that gonna last? Huh? Plenty. If you decide to go out and do a sprint. Thank you so much. I will watch that. I will keep this video forever. <laughs> if you go to do a sprint, you're only gonna have about 60 seconds in there. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending on how real full out you're gonna go. That's because you're gonna be relying on this for energy. You're gonna run out a lot faster only getting two at a time versus 36 at a time. So the lactic acid, this doesn't feel good in your muscles. The delayed onset muscle soreness, they used to think was lactic acid. Most of the evidence is suggesting this clears out a lot faster, that it's not really hanging out in your muscles. It's more that you have microtrauma to the muscles in there that's gonna cause some inflammation. Also, potentially some ion imbalances in there. That's more of the current thought on there. This, though, on the other hand, this is gonna be that burning you feel in the muscles. It is kind of your warning system in there saying, we don't like this. It doesn't necessarily mean you are at the stopping point. There's usually a little bit more in there before you physically have to stop, where your brain is telling you you want to stop before that. But you can actually go on further if you're willing to hurt a little bit more. So other things that you consume other than carbohydrates, what's another macronutrient you consume? So what did you have for breakfast? I didn't eat. Did anybody eat in here? Oh, thank God there's one. I have breakfast. I use the breakfast essentials. Because I only have two soup, I was thinking sleep in That helps. <laughs> so this is what your brain runs on. Just a little hint here, it's what your brain runs on. When you take a test, mm -hmm. you need to fuel your brain with a carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. So if your brain is short on carbohydrates, it's gonna just say, you know what, we need to prioritize things here. That means keeping you breathing and keeping your heart going. Good decisions aren't a priority for your brain. Being able to concentrate well isn't a priority for your brain. Being in a good mood isn't really a priority for your brain either. So typically, I will see people if they skip a meal before they take a test, they have a lot of difficulties. It's actually been some huge improvements I've seen in students that have started to eat something, like a piece of fruit before they take a test, or a glass of juice, something to feed their brain in there. <laughs> yeah. There's my problem. One person in here eating breakfast before you come. <laughs> so that's what you want to do. So another thing that you're going to consume Let's look at your fats. Most of the time when you consume a fat, you're gonna consume it in the form of a triglyceride. So triglyceride is gonna be a glycerol. And a glycerol is gonna have three carbons in it. And it's gonna have three fatty acids attached to it. that I'm gonna just abbreviate as FA here. So each of those fatty acids will have between 16 and 24 carbons on it. 16 to 18 is the most common. So you're gonna take and you're gonna split off the glycerol and the glycerol is going to come in here in the middle of this cycle. So if you are starving and your brain needs more, it can convert some of that glycerol to glucose. But remember, it's only got three carbons. 
It takes two of them to get to a glucose. You also have to have a use for all of this. These are going to come in two carbons at a time to acetyl-CoA. Two carbons at a time, so when it comes in, it has to go around this cycle. So for, say you have 16 here, that's gonna be eight acetyl-CoA's. You've got three of these, that's 24 acetyl-CoA's that's gonna come off of one triglyceride, minimum. 24 turns of the cycle. So in order to give your brain this, you're going to need to do a lot of turns of this cycle with it. The way to do more turns of this cycle is movement, exercise, the dirty work that nobody loves to do. So that's not really what it likes to do. When it does that, it's also gonna produce ketones that are gonna be a byproduct. And when you're producing those ketones, yes, they can, your brain can use them a little bit. It really doesn't like to. It is not its favorite fuel. This is the fuel it wants. This is, okay, I'm gonna keep the heart and lungs going, but I'm not gonna use this for other things. So the ketones, these are going to start to come out in your breath and your sweat. So when a person is starting to break down a lot of fat or a lot of protein in their body, one of the things you'll notice is their breath will change and it's not for a good change in there. Some people will say it's kind of a sweet smell, kind of like an acetone smell. To me, it smells a little bit more like ammonia. It's not a pleasant smell. Your sweat will also smell differently. So if you're doing a long endurance event where you're starting to break down more of your tissue and you go, I don't just smell sweaty, I smell bad. <laughs> That's what's gonna make you smell. So that's what's going to happen with your triglycerides. If you take in triglyceride that you don't need, what's going to happen is it says, you know what, I don't need this. I'm just going to send it back. And it goes to fat stores. So anything beyond what you need, We'll go to fat stores, 95% of it. So say you decide a butter cube looks good. <laughs> My dog really likes them. <laughs> so and you don't need the butter cube. You're not doing the activity for that. 95% of that butter cube stored. So think of it, putting that butter cube in your pocket. <laughs> for me, I know that's where the butter cube's going. It's gonna fit in my pants. It's not gonna squeeze anywhere else. So that's what happens there. The other nutrient you're going to take in is gonna be your proteins. So your proteins that you consume are gonna get broken down into the individual amino acids. These, what your body wants to do with them, pairs, building things, making structures, those types of activities with it. So the more muscle you are building, the more of this you would need. The more you're growing, like you're a kid getting taller, the more of this you need. If you're not really exerting yourself a whole lot to break things down, it doesn't take very much to maintain you. But that's where those want to go. So your amino acids, all have a similar structure. You have the acid group, a hydrogen, the amine group, and then you've got this R group that's your variable group. From all 20 amino acids, R is the only thing that's different on there. So what we have to do is pull this stuff off here, and we are going to deaminate these. So this process starts out in the liver, where you're going to deaminate them. You have to be able to deal with that nitrogen waste. So you deaminate it, then it will go to the kidneys, 
in the liver, you've made urea. You'll send it to the kidneys. And that's going to be excreted in your urine. So when you think about it, when you eat carbohydrates, where they end up going, a lot of them you're going to exhale. When you eat protein, you urinate out the waste. So kind of an unexpected place for it to go, but that's where a lot of it does. So you're going to have your urine excrete those things. You're going to have the rest of it here, and actually it's the amine that comes off. Sorry. I'm used to my other lecture where I'm showing the R is the only thing that's different. The amine comes off. The variable group has your carbons in it. So this nitrogen has to go here. And that's when it goes through the deamination process. So the rest of your amino acids, we have to bring over to this cycle here to process it. So some of them, we say they are glucogenic amino acids. What it means is they can be converted into glucose. So they come in at pyruvate or higher, and they can be converted into glucose because you can reverse this pathway. So when you didn't eat your breakfast before you came to class, and your brain is saying, oh God, I have to concentrate on this metabolism stuff, what it's gonna do is it's gonna hit up your liver or your muscles and say, you know what? We need some glucogenic amino acids in here. However, you're also, when you break it down, you get a mix where you're also going to get some ketogenic amino acids. They come in here at acetyl-CoA. They are also going to make ketones. So I could potentially really stress you out, make you have to think and concentrate really hard, and send you home a stinky mess for ketones today. So you're going to have a mix of both of those come from there. So they will come in various places down here, but remember, aerobic metabolism is required for this. So if you aren't actually doing anything to need to move more, and get more ATP out of this, this cycle slows down. So say you take in too much of that more than you need, these will come in and you've made these acetyl-CoA's. They will take this little detour back here to the fatty acids, they take this little detour here and here. So if you consume too much protein, what's going to happen is it will also turn to fat. So a lot of times people have this idea that I always see people will pick this as a test question. What happens if you eat too much protein? It turns into muscle. Really, you can just sit there and eat protein and turn into a bodybuilder. <laughs> you would be the first. So this is what happens to it. There is nothing that you get to eat that doesn't go into this cycle. So the idea that we can do a high protein diet and not gain any weight from it is really pretty absurd. You've got conservation of matter. If you put it in, it's got to go somewhere. It doesn't disappear into nowhere. So that's what happens to your amino acids. If you take in too many amino acids, basically your body is going to say, you know what, I'm not even going to start to touch the fat until I've broken down the carbohydrates and dealt with this excess protein. So all of these fats here that could have come in and been broken down, they're going to head this direction until you've dealt with all of the other things. So a lot of times we go, well, it's those carbohydrates that I want to avoid. If you consume too many carbohydrates, they'll store 75% of the calories as fat. So for the carbs, It's at 75% that goes to fat. So 75% times four calories per gram versus 95% at nine calories per gram. 
So which one's really going to do more fat storage damage if you overdo it? Protein. Well, the protein is going to just mean you store more of this, but if between these two, because a lot of times right now the fat is no carbs, no carbs, everybody doesn't want low carbs. It's what your brain runs on. But you know, you keep convincing a person that no carbs and they don't eat any, you can convince them of anything because their brain's not working afterwards. 75% of four calories versus 95% of nine calories. If you want to store fat, this is the most efficient way to do it. You want to store fat? Yes, load up with fat. They taste good, they're easy to eat. You know, you load something up with butter, anything cooked in butter is good. You know, your potato with a little bit of butter is okay. Your potato with a lot of butter tastes really good. So it's really our nature to want to overdo those things. So when you kind of see things like that with diets where they'll say, oh, you can eat, you know, unlimited on there. If there was any diet that you did where you said, nope, you're just eating this, you could actually do an ice cream diet where you said, oh, I'm eating this ice cream. You're likely going to consume fewer calories after a few days because you will get sick of it and you'll lose weight. But is your long-term weight loss going to be good from that? No. And when we look at the long-term weight loss from people that do things like the Atkins diet, yes, they will a lot of times initially lose weight. They are going to want to eat a carbohydrate sooner or later. They still have all these fats that are going to their fatty acid profiles are not going to be helpful. When you look at other diseases associated with a high fat intake, it's not good. And they will eventually eat another carbohydrate, and most of them will gain back all of the weight and then some. So that's kind of your overview of metabolism. Any questions? <laughs> so we'll go ahead and we'll stop that. You want a pan to get the picture? Thank <laughs> you.